Welcome to MSP Voice, the weekly show for MSPs by MSPs. Brought to you by MSP360, the number one cross-platform cloud backup. Learn more at msp360.com. This is MSP Voice. Hello and welcome to MSP Voice. This is episode number 56. Today, I am very pleased to be joined by Brian Helwig, uh, who is the CEO now of the entity formerly known as Cloudberry Lab, which is now MSP360. So that might be a little confusing, uh, but just understand that Cloudberry Lab, our sponsor, um, and who I work for, is now MSP360. Um, we'll be known as that going forward. And Brian is the CEO, so I got a great interview with him today uh, coming up. Stick around. He talks a lot about sales and hiring salespeople, how to retain salespeople. So it's, it's a really good discussion on sales. Uh, before we get into that, though, again, mspvoice.com, your source for all things MSP Voice. Definitely check it out. If you want to be a guest, just click on the Be the Next Guest, fill out the form. I will get back to you with on how to schedule. It's really simple. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, we do have another webinar coming up in our webinar series. VCIO Toolbox will be coming up um, on August 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern, so be sure to check that out. Um, and also, if you didn't catch our live webinar uh, last week with TechStack, uh, definitely check it out. The, it's, on, it's here on the mspvoice.com. You can catch it on the, a YouTube replay. Um, really interesting company. They are like home advisor for MSPs. So they match MSPs with SMBs. Um, really cool, really cool model and some, you know, their pricing model I think is, is very fair as well. Uh, so no real news this week other than the fact that Cloudberry Lab is now MSP 360 um, uh, with new leadership under Brian Helwig, who's my guest this week. So I wanted to share that. Um, but other than that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the episode. Enjoy. Um, happy to be here. Happy to be working with Brian again. Uh, so take a listen and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Hello and welcome to MSP Voice. Today, I am very excited to be joined by not only my boss, but the new CEO of Cloudberry Lab, Brian Helwig. Brian, hello. Hey, Doug. How are you? How's everybody out there in the MSP Voice community today? I've, Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Uh, I wanted to have you on because there's a couple of things going on at, at, at Cloudberry. One, obviously, is, is you. Um, even though you've been with us for a couple of months now, it's, it's official, it's announced, you're the new CEO. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it's been great. Actually, it's a, you know, having an opportunity here to come to Cloudberry and leverage some of my past experience at Veeam, uh, Nedrix and be able to work with you again, yes. um, has been actually just, it, you know, it, it's just been great. And it's been really great to kind of come back to what I'll call the, you know, the, the Veeam roots and continue to evolve and build, um, not only what we're doing, what we've done and take what we've learned in the past and evolve on top of what we're doing today, but also it's a whole new market. It's a, a lot of fun. The technology is amazing. So I'm really excited about it. Cool. Yeah. I, I miss having you next to me in my office. Uh, <laughs> <at me. laughs> we, yeah, teams are a little despair these days, but yeah, much yeah. better, much better. Still close, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so uh, you know, again, you bring a wealth of experience. We've worked together before, but there's also some other news that, that Cloudberry is, is talking about. And this, you know, it, some eagle-eyed people may have noticed it already if they watched the YouTube videos, but Cloudberry yeah. is, is going through a name change. That's right. That's right. We're actually going to change our name to MSP360. And, we're, you know, we're changing our name for a couple of different reasons. Okay. Uh, you know, the first one is we have an amazing platform to offer, right? When you actually think of Cloudberry and you look at managed service providers right out there, who is our target audience? Well, our target audience is MSPs, right? Mm -hmm. That's who we talk about day in and day out. That's who we service day in and day out. We have a backup platform that is an amazing platform and it touches every cloud disk, every local disk. As long as it's a NAS, as long as there's a cloud storage provider that's out there, we offer the full circle, mm -hmm. the full suite, the full 360 of every cloud provider out there. And so when we started to think about who our target market was and how we could talk to them, MSP360 came out. We've also realized that and recognized that our core customers being managed service providers, we we're really want to continue to evolve and enhance our services so that we can eventually, one point in time, 
so we can eventually, at some point in time, <laughs> some point in time, be able yeah, be able to offer a full suite of tools in the general overall data protection suite. I mean, today uh -huh. we do backup. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, who knows? But being a platform for managed service providers, MSP 360 says, hey, today we offer a full suite of disaster recovery services that allow you to back up your data in the cloud. And tomorrow, we may offer a whole host of other services that allow you to do a lot more. Okay. And, you know, from, you know, personally, MSP360.com is a lot easier than CloudBerryLab.com. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's a lot shorter. It's a lot easier to remember. That's absolutely yeah. true. Great. So, so that's kind of, that's, that's the CloudBerry slash MSP360 news, you know, again, welcome. Great to have you on board. Um, but what we wanted to do is talk a little bit more about bringing some of your experience and sharing that with the MSP community. Uh, you know, yeah. you're, you, you've obviously, you've worked at, at several companies um, in, in the past. You've, you've built some great teams. You know, I, I, I was witness to that when, when we were at Veeam, but you know, a lot of times our, our MSPs and, and, and our audience, they're always looking for, you know, advice and things like that, especially on the sales and marketing side. Absolutely. So I wanted Absolutely. to, yeah, so I wanted to focus a little bit today in talking about sales and, you know, how do you build an effective sales team? How do you hire? How do you compensate? You know, these are all questions that I hear from MSPs all the time. So. Yeah, no, little? actually, yeah, thank you. You know, actually, <laughs> um, there's, you know, I'm an avid reader. I think uh -huh. any CEO, right? I'm sure you are as well. Any CEO out there that's out running and trying to develop not only himself, but to develop the teams, pay attention to the market that he's in, paying attention to what's going on around him is constantly always reading. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the better books that I've read, and I'm going to start with this because I'm going to talk a little bit about it, um, is this one. Never hire a bad salesperson. <laughs> I you know what? It's the shortest book and read that you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it absolutely allows for you to identify the key traits to somebody that's going to, for somebody that's going to be in your organization that's going to be successful. Okay. So what are the key traits, right? When you sit here and a guy comes in the door and you're a managed service provider, it's not, can he manage windows? It's not, can he <laughs> reset a password? It's not, you know, uh, does he understand the technology? Technology does play a part in it, but the biggest part is drive. Mm -hmm. Sales reps need to have drive and they need to be driven. And you really identify drive by three, three things. Motivation. Does he want to achieve? You know, ask him, what are you doing on your day-to-day -day life that allows that, that you want to achieve? You know, why do you wake up in the morning? What mm -hmm. makes you tick? If he can tell you what that is, then you ha at least you have the first driver. Okay. Right. The very first qualifier, motivation. Second one is competition. When you talk about, you know, somebody who's in sales, if you go off and you look, you're at a, you're at a, a family reunion, mm -hmm. right? The sales guys in the family reunion are the ones that are racing, right? Hey, let's go get in a <laughs> rowboat and let's race to the other end to you get there first. <laughs> hey, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's have a volleyball competition and let's see who can, you know, or basketball or whatever support your family plays. Those are the things that actually show you, hey, this guy's got competition. So if he has motivation mm -hmm. and he has competition, the next thing he needs is optimism. Okay. He needs to understand that no matter what you put in front of him, there's an opportunity he's going to be able to succeed. Right? He believes in himself that he woke up today, I can do that. I can hit that mountain and I can actually achieve the exact result that I want to. So he's motivated, he's competitive, and he's got optimism. So he's got a willingness to be able to basically it's the drive function that we talk about and that actually defines the best salesperson. Okay. Yeah. And you know, a lot of those, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of salespeople in my, in my history, yeah. and, you know, th th those traits um, are, are definitely ones of, you know, of, of the better ones uh, that, that I've worked with and you know, the competitive side, you know, all good salespeople, they're very competitive. So. <laughs> and the, the other, the other one to look for is the guy that just bought the boat. We yeah. say that too, right? <laughs> yeah, the guy that just turned around and bought the boat and he has this need and desire to want to pay for and, and continue to get the additional toys. Uh, coming in the door and you know, seeing him sitting at his desk, he's first in, he's, la he's last out, mm -hmm. he's determined to be able to get through a certain goals for the day. That's one of the questions that we ask when the sales rep comes to us. Is that I tell him, okay, today's your first day at Cloudberry. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And we ask them this on a clean slate. And the reason why we ask them on a clean slate is we want to know if he can 
say, hey, well, let's see, on my last job, I came in in the morning and said, you know what, I'm going to do 10 dials first thing in the morning, and then I'm going to work on my emails, and then I'm going to call my existing prospects. And he has a set schedule and routine that he goes through that he knows that works for him. Mm -hmm. That's another indicator that you have somebody that's pretty well put together from an organization perspective. Okay. And hopefully they bring then the motivation and the, you know, the competitiveness and the, you know, the willingness to be off and, and, you know, being optimistic, the willingness to stay late and be able to kind of drive the business. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. That's what I look for. Yeah. So, you know, you, you talk about motivation. Um, and yep. you, know, you, you mentioned the toys uh, that, that some sales yep. like the boats, the cars, all those all those fun things. Um, yep, the cash, the cash. So that brings up compensation, and mm-hmm. you know I I know that there's you know there's been a lot of I've seen a lot of discussion amongst MSPs on what's the best compensation model. You know how do I how do I incent my salespeople to to sell? Uh, you know. And, and there's, I know there's a different different schools of thought out there on, on this. What do you see as, as being effective in, in motivating salespeople? Yeah, so in the basically commission compensation model, right? That's why they're here. Yeah. They're here to actually earn it. So my, my view is it's usually a 50-50. Well, actually, I'm sorry. It's usually a 50-50 blend on commission versus base. So let's okay. say, for example, we have a sales rep that has, um, we'll call it $70,000 a year is his mm-hmm. total, what we call our his total cash compensation. Okay. I also, I also layer in an MBO or a bonus. Okay. And the way that that works is on the $70,000 total cash compensation, $10,000 of that would be based on hitting his target, his, his quota. So $2,500 a quarter mm-hmm. for hitting his quota each quarter. Okay. The other, the other 60 is split by 30,000 base and 30,000 variable. Okay. And the other element of my commission plans is they have no ceiling. They have no, that you can continue to grow. So they have to have an incentive tier. Mm -hmm. So what I look at as a good comp plan is number one, besides the 50, 50 blend on what he's taking home and the incentive to hit his quota, the first three tiers that he moves through, he might get something like 5% for the first tier, 10% for the second tier, 12% for the third tier. Okay. But by the time he gets to his third tier, he may have sold a half a million dollars in software mm-hmm. for the year, right? Yeah. Now the tier four comes in and that might be like a 17% commission. Mm-hmm. And he looks at that. This is the, the drive function, right? He mm-hmm. looks at this comp plan and he says, So all I have to do is sell $500,000 worth of software and you're going to pay me 17% of every deal. (laughs) Yes. Please sell, please create this problem for me. Right. Because the next year, yes, it'll go up, Mm -hmm. but he'll have the same incentives there. And the other aspect is I really, really, really encourage some type of, you have to create some kind of sales performance incentive, right? What they call a SPIF, sales performance incentive fund. SPIFs, what they do for your sales team, if they're structured correctly, is they allow them to start to compete very effectively with one another. And I'm going to use one that I actually just did here at uh, MSP360, used to be known as Cloudberry, not too long ago. So our Q2 competition, everybody had the same comp plan that they had in Q1. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we introduced a very simple $1,500 bonus that was going to be paid to the person furthest over quota. Okay. So whoever went past the, the most or whoever went the furthest distance mm-hmm. over their quota was the one that was going to win the additional $1,500. So as the competition kicked off month one, everybody's going along and you could start to see the horses, right? Everybody's like <laughs> person one is in first place and two, and then, then you have person three is now in fourth place and he's up on third and, mm-hmm. and they're starting to kind of jockey with each other with who's going to win. And they're coming in by the second month and they're saying, I'm $500 ahead of you. I'm $1,000 ahead of you. I'm $2,000 ahead of you. And you could see out of the four individuals, you could see the one sort of, they kind of started to fall away, Mm -hmm. but the other three individuals were neck and neck. And when we got to the third month, it was so intense that it was down to like, who is going to actually get the guy to pay at the last minute to get over the line and continue Mm -hmm. to stay ahead of the other guy. When the competition closed, I don't want to use his name, but he called me on the phone. He said, Mm -hmm. I love you and I hate you at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) He said, because I stayed 
in the afternoons all the way up until the last minute, making sure I got my deals in, mm -hmm. things came in the right way. I was given, he was given specific incentives to allow larger customers to come across the line. And he worked with those customers and had the best opportunity to get that done. And he was able to prove that not only could you achieve and outperform your quota, but you could outperform one another. And what yeah. was really cool, after all that was said and done, the next day comes, we announce who wins. We do a small pizza party, right? Everybody's pretty happy about, okay, we're celebrating. The next day they come in and they say, what's the next competition ball, <laughs> right? And we yep. said, okay, so let's start another one, right? So the guy that was in second, he's going, no way you're gonna beat me this time. And the guy that was in third, like me either. And so the healthy competition is continued and it, it really allows the team to flourish. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like you said at the beginning, competitive. That's that's one of the that's one of the key traits. So, add right. add a little bit in there. Now, you know that that's great if you have you know a multi person sales team. Um, but you know, I know a lot of MSPs. You know, they may not even have a salesperson yet. They're just looking to hire their first one, or they may only have one salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you know, how uh, do you motivate them? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I think a lot of it is the same way. Um, when I one of my experiences I've had where I actually only had one salesperson for a short period of time in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, we had these spiffs that were going on in another part of the world, but of course he couldn't participate in it because yeah. it was just him and it didn't make any sense that they were selling in Europe, different currency, different, mm -hmm. everything altogether was different. So here I am with one guy, we'll call him Ray. <laughs> and Ray was, you know, Ray sitting here going, Hey, you know, I, I need to be motivated. I want to be more motivated. The comp plan's great. I'm pushing myself as hard as I can. But what I did is something is really, 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 really simple is I actually drug in a, a 50 inch TV mm -hmm. and right in the box. And it actually said for Ray, if he beats his quota. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and he came in every morning and he saw this thing and it says, I really get that 55 inch TV. I said, yeah, you get the 55 inch TV as soon as you get over quota. Mm -hmm. Over the next couple of months, we hired another guy that came in the door and he said, hey, how do I get to be one of the ones on the name for the TV? And I said, well, the next competition will be the two of you. But what was interesting was it was a way for him to understand a little bit more. Some people are visual. Some mm -hmm. people are audible, right? Yeah. And in his case, I was able to recognize he was visual because when he looked at his pipeline, when he looked at um, the way he was managing his business, he always looked at it in graphs. Okay. He would come in and he would pick things up. So being an effective leader also understands how people, especially pushing a sales team, how they learn and how they're motivated and how you can show them to move faster. And so when I realized he was visual, I actually, I mean, the idea wasn't really by, by itself. I called a friend of mine and said, hey, how do you motivate one guy? And he said, well, that he's visual. He goes, give him a TV. I said, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, what was the cost of that TV? The cost of the TV was probably about $800. It was a good TV. It was a Sony. It was there in front of him, right? But at the same time, he came in every morning, and that was that little extra was there to keep him to continue to call and just kind of go over the line. Uh, that's one. Another way, outside of just the simple TV way, is it, I'll call it end-of-year incentives. So you can okay. have short-term goals like the TV, and you can have long-term goals. So if I have one sales rep, for let's say eight, eight months, nine months. I come to him and I say, hey, look, we'll call this guy John. I say, John, today, you know, you've been with us for eight months, you've been doing a great job. Um, we're gonna put together a couple of really small, really small milestones for you to hit, but it's gonna result in a great Christmas bonus. Right? Okay. It's right around the time when you know, um, your overall, you know, the, the, the business is starting to grow. We need you here a little bit more and yeah. we wanna help you share in kind of our success. You're helping us. It doesn't have to be a profit sharing program. It can be something as simple as a couple of thousand dollars to allow that person to be able to have a great Christmas or be able to, you know, who knows, uh, maybe they have a, a car that they're only a couple thousand dollars of paying off and they can, they can do that. Um, another one, which I did mention something like profit sharing is, can be an option depending on what, how you're structured. Okay. Right. Um, you can also, um, you know, give money to somebody's 401k. You could say, Hey, look, I'm going to fund a hundred percent of your retirement for the, for, you know, put $5,000 in your retirement fund. There's a little bit of an offset there for the business. They're able to write that off and reduce some profit that helps the owners okay. right side of life. It gives some of them that incentive. Um, you also are able to supplement bet, uh, benefits as they do better. If you talk to your employees, right. And you say, Hey, look, we're doing really well. And they're like, you know, 
I don't want the thousand or fifteen hundred dollars more a quarter. It would be great if my medical benefits were two hundred dollars a month cheaper. Yeah. Well, okay. Right. That's easy. <laughs> it's the same amount of money. You're able to reduce it. They're going to continue to be happy and perform. So yeah. the other part of it is is to kind of sit down with your guys and find out what makes what why do they run? What mm -hmm. makes them run? What motivates them? Right. Sometimes it's also time off. Hey, yeah. if you deliver on these things, I'll give you the. I'll give you the week off. Go ahead. You know, all the Christmas, I'm going to pay you for Christmas, deliver on these things. And, you know, no, you don't have to worry about the vacation time. Go spend the time with your family. There's okay. different, all kinds of different reward factors you can bring in. Okay. So, and, and kind of in terms of the measurement, obviously quota, right, is, yep. is the easiest way to measure, right? They're, they're either going to hit it or they're not. Um, it's, right. It's pretty black and white. It's very measurable. Are there other things to measure success though, besides just did they hit their sales quota and, and maybe as part of their MBL? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, I talk about this all the time, right? Revenue is the result of the right activity. Mm -hmm. So, right. So if you sit down and you say, Oh my gosh, I missed my quota. It's too late. It's sort of like, um, I, I kind of tease, you know, you, you go and you download something like Quicken, right? For your own personal budget. Yeah. And everybody downloads it and they install it and they connect it to their bank. And what does Quicken do? Quicken looks at you and says, hey, you already spent all your money. Guess where it went? <laughs> well, you can't do anything about the past. Right? Yeah. You, can't change, you can't go back. Well, you can return all your clothes, I guess. But <laughs> outside of that, you know, you, you're, you're not going to be returning the car. You're not going to be returning the food. You're not going to be doing those things. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you end up measuring a sales rep to know that he's going to be successful? Because that's the other part of the of a leader and whether you're a three man shop or 30 man or 300 man, it doesn't matter. Your role is to make sure that your team, you got the right people around you and that they can be successful. Mm -hmm. So really simple. It's the right activity. So you have to sit down and if you're, let's say for example, I'm, I'm the CEO. Oh, well, I am. And I'm <laughs> going to sit here and I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to hire my first guy, right? Maybe I built the company from the ground up. I haven't done that in this case. Mm -hmm. But in other businesses I have been involved in, I have actually had an opportunity to be involved in the ground. And I was, in one case, the first sales rep. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I started to understand the value proposition that I was creating. What type of conversation was I having with my customer? Okay. I have this rule. I have this very simple rule. I talk to our sales team about this all the time. If we're going to lose on price, then just reduce it to a dollar. <laughs> because at that point, right, it's just based on price. Yeah. There's not any value. The value that we offer in our, in your solution and in your services is so important for your sales team to understand your customer, or potential customer or prospect can talk about price at the end. Mm -hmm. Any good sales team says, Hey, we'll worry about price when we get there. We're not going to lose on price. We want to make sure that you're getting the value because okay. The first, you know, the first sale is great, but the renewal is better yeah. and keeping those customers longer term is better, making sure they're happy, making sure yeah. we understand what's going on. So when I talk to the sales team, I talk about the right activity produce produces pipeline. That pipeline then produces revenue. So if as a founder CEO, if you're sitting here, you're working, you've built the pipeline, you've gone out, pounded the pavement, you've gone door to door, maybe you've done mailers, maybe you've done emailing, maybe you've done cold calling, maybe you flipped open the phone book if they still exist and <laughs> dial and dial and dial and dial and dial, right? And you say, hey, this is the service that I have to offer. There's some way that you got them to pay attention to you for at least five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then if you teach that same process to another one or two individuals, you can triple your capacity. Yeah. And then you can continue to coach and guide them and continue to refine the message so that you, your number when you're when they do connect with you, the chances of them coming in and understanding the services you provide, whether you're providing um, data recovery, data backup or recovery, but using Cloudberry or or MSP three hundred and sixty, yeah. you know, soon to be, right? <laughs> or or if you are you know leveraging RMM, if you're going to do patch management, if you're going to um, it'll do a full deployment, server upgrades, operating system upgrades migration, uh, internal, external from cloud services like DNS sure. from internal to outside like Route 53 or something to that effect. Those are all services that you can offer. People see value in those services. So mm -hmm. if you can teach your sales team how to understand that value, how to position, and more importantly, ask the prospect what problem they have <laughs> that you can solve today. 
that's the number one you know question hey how's it going what problems do you have in your IT infrastructure today are you happy with the current service provider you have yeah. do you feel like you know um, that you, you need to have a, a uh, have you tried to recover a file and, and struggled yeah. you know we offer services that allow for you to back up be able to recover we do proactive patch management we don't want you to get the virus we don't want you to yeah. have the malware and in the event that you know somebody does that by accident, well, we want to have the opportunity to be able to recover those files, bring them back. Your business continues to run, and that's a value add that they that they sell. So those are the pro I'd start with the problems, mm -hmm. and then evolve through the different products and services that you offer as the solution. Okay, and then I know one other thing that happens quite a bit, especially in a smaller shop, is the founder slash owner CEO um, will mm -hmm. oftentimes insert him or herself um, into calls yeah. or get brought along on every call, even though that's why they hired a salesperson so they didn't have to do that anymore. Any advice there for, you know, an owner operator sure. to, to not have to be involved in every call? Yeah. So the, the, the real crux is when do you get out of it, right? When do you yeah. kind of say, Hey, I, I don't, I don't want to be involved in every call anymore. Mm -hmm. I only want to be involved in either a strategic discussion or maybe it's a large opportunity that I want to help you qualify, understand the problem to bring it across the line. Yeah. I, I kind of break these out into three steps. My first one is when I'm hiring um, new people, like we, even we just got new people here in, the, in sales of North America, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, Jeremy and Seth. So those two guys, I, uh, I, I talk to them once a day right now, believe it or not, I call them in the, in the evenings and I say, Hey, how you feeling? Are, you know, tell me a little bit about what you learned today about the product and the positioning. Um, you know, are you struggling? Are you concerned? Where do you lack confidence in your ability to do a demo? Where do you lack confidence in your ability to have somebody ask you a tough question? Mm -hmm. And do you know where to go when those things happen? Right? You don't have to know every answer. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Let me get you somebody who who can help. Yeah. And bring that person in and learn from that, and then continue to evolve. But the first part is understanding where they are in that comfort zone. Once you understand where they are in the comfort zone, then it's your job to start to push them back and encourage them to make mistakes. Allow them to work with some of your lower end prospects, allow them to ask questions, allow the dialogue, and again, start to take a step back. Once they get their feet underneath them and they become more confident, the two things, one, they, ha they, they have a good idea and are confident in their ability to position the solution mm -hmm. and the different solutions that you offer to the customer, and the second thing is they're, they're okay that they understand that they can make a mistake and get the help that they need right away and not lose the deal. Yeah. Once those two things are done, then you can kind of go to the third phase. And the third phase is where you're walking in and you're saying, hey, tell me about the large opportunities you're working on that you think I should be involved in. Okay. And then they're going to start to, you know, they're going to start to coddle along and say, hey, I think, um, you know, these two I'm a little bit concerned about because I don't think we do this. <laughs> these two I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty com confident in but I wouldn't mind having you there just from a, a, a PR perspective, just your mm -hmm. sheer reputation of saying, Hey, this is what you know, uh, this is our CEO. He's invested in seeing you successful. Yeah. Um, this is the guy that you can call if things aren't going well. He's here. I can talk to him. You can talk to him. Um, you know, business is a lot about relationships, but once we get, you get those things down then you can start to repeat your process and you can, the, you can develop assets where um, sales reps are able to do quick demos or do product positioning and solution right. positioning as you become a, you know, a managed service, a more developed sales team in the managed service provider space. Yeah. And, you know, actually, quite honestly, one of the other things you have to realize, and I guess I should have said this before everything else, <laughs> is you need to make an investment and in either time teaching mm -hmm. or you're going to buy the skills. So if you're looking for somebody okay. fresh out of school, right, you're going to be paying them a base of thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a year, yeah. with a variable based on performance. But you're going to spend a lot of time teaching them, if as long as they have the drive functions, right? Mm -hmm. You vetted that out. You read the book. Never hire a bad salesperson again. Yep. You come back. You ask the <laughs> questions. You're like, okay, this guy's got motivation. I can teach him how to position the product. That's one aspect. That takes your time. Mm -hmm. The other option is to hire somebody that's their third or fourth year experience in sales, give them the incentives that you talked about it. We talked about in the commission plan, yeah. let them get off the ground and running. Now, which one is best in my opinion? I'll give you this one. If you want, I know you don't, I know you're going to ask me that question. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and throw this out there. Okay. 
my opinion is in the beginning is for you to hire the first one. So less experience, more drive. Mm-hmm. You can coach and, and you can play with because we make the mistakes. We think we know what we want them to do. And if you have a senior person that's there, you're going to frustrate them. Yeah. So if you take the junior people and you keep working with them and you figure it out on your own and exactly what it is they should be doing and, and how to make sort of like mini use and they're mm-hmm. starting to develop. Now one of those guys is going to start to take off. When you introduce a third, a third person or a fourth person, you're going to see who's going to start to evolve as that leader and you can coach and guide them. Okay. And then eventually maybe have a team of like four or five. Okay. Um, that's been my experience. My experience yep. is you're always better in the beginning, building the people from the ground up mm-hmm. and allowing them to learn, to learn your business, learn your positioning, learn what services you have to offer rather than going off and paying me for the additional talent. Okay. Yeah. You know, it, 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 again, it's, if you have the time, because <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, either way. it's either money or time. You can't, you can't have it. Yeah, it's either money or time. <laughs> that's right. It's the money or time. Great. Uh, so before we leave, any other advice for MSPs, you know, specifically in, in their sales journey, um, you know, especially if they're just thinking about maybe hiring their first salesperson? Absolutely. Um, it's really actually going to sound a little crazy, but understanding why you lose is more important than understanding why you win. Okay. You, right. You have day in and day out when you go into each one of your customer locations, whether you're serving a series of dental offices or whether you're serving a bunch of lawyers Mm -hmm. or whether you're in construction or you're in the finance space, financial services, you walk in the door and you're doing your solution positioning. And more often than not, we hear no. And that's, that's when we stop listening, but you have to understand, you have to be able to keep both ears on and hear no. Why? What is it that I'm not offering that you need? The reason why that's so important is because as you continue to evolve and especially scale, right? You hire your first salesperson. One of the things you give up is control. Mm -hmm. You no longer in in the middle of that (laughs) deal anymore. So what happens next is you got, not only do you have to have confidence in this, you have to be willing to give up the control, but that means you have to understand why he's winning and why he's losing. And if you understood why you were losing, well, you can help him better position the products that you offer today or you can start to change the services that you offer to be more relevant to your market. Okay. I know that in, I know in some of the managed service providers that I look at, even because I talk to all of our MSPs as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. When I go out to a show or I talk to them and I ask them questions like, tell me a little bit about what your concerns are or what market you're serving. They say, well, I'm serving the dental market. And you go to their website and it's, the number one IT provider for everybody that's a dentist in Connecticut. And you're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Like you can see it. I'm the number one managed service provider or IT services provider for the legal offices in Rhode Island. Yeah. And you're going, hmm, right? And they, they literally are interfacing with these clients day in and day out, uh, face to face, right? They walk mm-hmm. down the street, uh, they walk across the street, they see them at the local pub, they see them at the local restaurant. And they build the relationships. And sometimes they also even help out their parents along the way too that might have a business. (laughs) But at the end of the day, right, these guys are always listening to their market. They're listening to who they serve and they adjust their services. But in order to, and if you're going to branch into another market, you have to understand that one just as much as as well. So being able to listen to why you fail is almost, in my opinion, it's more important than understanding why you succeed. Okay. Great, great advice. Um, Brian, Thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure I'll have Thanks, you ben. on again at, at, at some point in the future. Um, you know, maybe we'll talk some some marketing or, or, or some other areas for for MSP. Absolutely. Um, again, Absolutely. welcome to MSP 360. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Uh, the new name. So uh, you know, I, it's been great working with you in the past. I'm looking forward to working with you more now. Yeah, we've got a big road ahead of us. I'm looking forward to the growth as well. Yes, we do. That's awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Great. Thank you. You too.